Excellent. So welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. This is the, the end of August edition. We made it to the end of August. Um, nothing else. We've got some good stuff to cover this week uh, with Alan Foster from our Scoundrels team taking us through the framework bits as we go through the slide deck here. So let's hop on in. I'm going to hand the mic over to Alan here and uh, let him take it away. Mr. Foster. Thank you. Uh, cool. So if we jump into the next slide, uh, we'll talk about the new modules that have landed to Metasploit Framework. Um, firstly, community member Senofax has contributed a vBulletin widget template RC module, which gains unauthenticated remote code execution on vulnerable, vulnerable vBulletin targets. Uh, upon receiving a specially crafted HTTP request from this module, a vulnerable target will allow arbitrary PHP code execution within the context of the application server. Community member Hootie has contributed two new modules uh, related to Microtech, one for processing and gathering general device information from the device, and another for importing Microtech configuration files. Our very own Spencer McIntyre has contributed a new Jupyter login utility scanner module, and we'll be seeing a demo of that today. And community member Tim WR has contributed a Safari WebKit JIT exploit for iOS 7.1.2 which gains a root level shell by leveraging multiple exploits chained together. And on the next slide, uh, even more modules. Uh, our very own Will Vu has contributed a exploit module for Apache Offbiz ERP solution. Uh, we'll have a demo of this later today. And not only that, it was also PR number 14,000, which is pretty crazy. Uh, community member Divi Duhing has contributed a module for authenticated remote command injection um, within the web interface of Getterbrook, GCAM, and G-Code products. Community member Red Suxff has contributed an exploit module for the D-Link Wi-Fi manager software, uh, which allows for code execution by sending a malicious PHP code via cookie. And we'll have a demo of that later today, which is pretty awesome. And finally, we have a team viewer module by community member Hootie that exploits an uncoded parameter call within the team viewer URI handler to create an SMB connection to an attacker controlled IP. And there's also a demo of this. For enhancements and features, um, just the top level highlights, uh, community member Heinick Paycheck has improved the scanner library code and framework so that a multi-threaded scanner operations won't block progress waiting on the slowest thread. Uh, previously, the scanner library code would wait for all threads to complete before spawning even more threads. Uh, so serious improvement came there. And Alan Foster, myself, has added initial support for wrap tables to Metasploit's console, uh, which you hopefully improve the column text appearance. And this functionality is currently opt-in, and we'll have a demo of what that means later. Our very own Dean Welch has added support for importing MMAP vulnerabilities, and we'll have a demo of that later too. And for bug fixes, community member Beacles has provided a fix for a directory path traversal attack in Metasploit itself, uh, which we appreciate the disclosure and fix for. Our very own Dean Welch has added an authentication, has fixed an authentication bug within the WinRM module, which was previously returning false negatives, um, even whenever you had valid credentials for uh, WinRM against a target host. And lastly, our very own Grant Wilcox has improved MSF Venom's error message whenever a payload module was not being specified. And for details on recent framework activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog post at blog.rapid7.com. And as always, we really appreciate everyone who helps make Metasploit better through the contributions to the project. So thank you. And now we'll jump to demos. Um, first, we have a D-Link central Wi-Fi manager by Shell Lucas. You ready, Shelby? Yep. Cool. Yeah, so uh, this module exploits the D-Link central Wi-Fi manager, which is it's basically just this uh, AP uh, manager. Um, so uh, I believe it's only on uh, Windows platforms, uh, as far as I know. Uh, so basically what happens is that uh, it sends a username cookie to a, uh, a call to eval, uh, which 
basically allows you to get code execution as system. And that's actually pretty much it. Uh, it's unauthenticated. Um, and yeah, it takes a little while to get the session, but you end up getting system. That's great. Thanks, Shelby. Um, next, we have a Apache OffBiz RCA by Spencer McIntyre. Ready, Spencer? Yes, I am. All right, here we go. All right, so this uh, module was uh, written by our very own Will Vu, and it exploits a unauthenticated RCE vulnerability that's uh, basically due to Java deserialization within the XML RPC interface of Apache of Viz. Uh, so we're going to go through and we're going to set some of the options here. Um, and the check method is actually going to try to deserialize a null payload. So it's, it's a pretty confident check that the vulnerability is going to be present because it attempts to trigger it and then analyzes uh, the error message. So once we know that the target is in fact vulnerable, we're going to go ahead and set the options necessary for our payload uh, before we go ahead and exploit it. And we can see it's pretty quick. And we end up with a responsive session after a couple of seconds. Um, in this case, it is root. I don't believe it's always going to be root. This is specific to my target environment, but it's going to be executed within the context of the Apache of Biz application. That's great. Uh, and another demo from yourself, Spencer, with the Jupyter login scanner. That's right. I'm back. <laughs> All right, uh, so this is not an exploit module. This is uh, an auxiliary module that will go ahead and identify um, unauthenticated instances of Jupyter, as well as uh, brute force uh, instances that do require authentication. So we just saw that that instance was protected by authentication as newer installations are by default. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to set our options uh, as appropriate here. And then we're gonna go ahead and run this module. Uh, so Jupyter is a very popular uh, data science application. So it's something that uh, could be identified in environments uh, where uh, data is being analyzed. Uh, so in this case, uh, we kind of just missed it, but it did identify that Jupyter was running and it also pulled uh, the version information before identifying that it required authentication and then attempting to brute force it. Thanks, Spencer. Uh, awesome. So. I'll be talking about opt-in features. Uh, so to test novel, but potentially backwards and compatible um, features, uh, Minusploit 6 has introduced the concept of features. Uh, and this new command allows for the opt-in functionality um, to be enabled, as we'll see in the next few slides. Um, so firstly, you open up Minusploit as normal. Um, and then on the next slide, we'll see that you can run the features command, which will show the available features that can be enabled. For now, there are only two features, uh, wrap tables and our host HTTP URL. Uh, we'll see demos of them separately, but this is purely focusing on how to enable the features. And in the next slide, we'll see uh, to enable a feature flag, just use the feature set feature name and provide true or false. In this example, we're specifying that we'd like to turn on wrap tables as true. And finally, uh, you can go ahead and save these. Uh, so by default, if you turn on a feature and you close your session and you reopen it, it will not be persisted. Instead, you can use the save command to persist these. And finally, if you wish to see the configuration file, it's currently stored in MSF4 config file. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much how to enable the features. Uh, and I will see an example of that within the wrap tables. So Metasploit has now added opt-in support for wrapping tables. In the above slide, we can see the options, descriptions of a module overflowing in the next line, and it's currently hard to read. And in some extreme cases, it's very hard to read. Um, so instead, to enable wrapped tables, which is opt-in, uh, you'll need to run feature set wrap tables true. And optionally, you can persist this configuration value. And this is what it'll do. It'll sort of uh, properly align the description information. Uh, and hopefully, that will be more readable as a result. And in the next slide, we can see the sort of before and after more clearly. And as a final showcase, uh, as an extreme example, I guess, uh, although not officially supported, Termux will be more readable as a result. Um, and again, this functionality is behind a feature um, command uh, that is done so because it may break users' workflows in unexpected ways, particularly if it's um, automated workflows. Um, so if you do test this feature and notice any issues, be, uh, be sure to reach out to us. 
Any questions? Do, uh, do those get exposed and respected in um, Pro Console as well? Uh, it's currently disabled for Pro Console, but that's something I'll be looking into. Gotcha. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, awesome. Uh, now we have a demo from Dean uh, to do with the R host HTML HTTP URL option. Yep. Ready, Dean? Yep, far away. So, like Alan said, this is also set behind a feature flag. Um, so it's just me turning on the exact same way he did for the uh, for the wrap tables. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to jump into uh, a module that supports uh, that uses HTTP URLs. I'm using WinRM here, and you can see the new option our host HTTP URL has already been populated with sort of um, default values. But you can actually set this and just copy paste in any um, HTTP URL, say from your browser, from any uh, um, site you may be targeting, and it will automatically set your usual, the usual suspects, I suppose. Um, so you can see that our host has been set to example.com, port has been set, SSL has been set to true. Um, but even better than that is that after you set the upper host HTTP URL, you can then go back and individually set some options and it will update, uh, as you can see there, you actually update the R host HTTP URL as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully this will make things a little easier um, in, any, in any pen test you guys are doing. Awesome. Uh, and finally, uh, another demo from Dean uh, to do with importing MMAP vulnerabilities. Yeah, so I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but Nmap has a whole bunch of scripts. One of them is called uh, Vulners. You can see the command I ran up in the top left-hand side there. Um, what that command does is it goes off and uses the Vulner script to determine um, what vulnerability certain versions of software that Nmap has determined to have, uh, determined your target system to have. Um, so what this has done is I've imported the, uh, sorry, that went really fast. The, uh, I, I, I pre-ran that MMAT script. So on the right-hand side, you can see me importing the XML that I outputted. And um, the DB is now been populated with the host, the bones that I found. And then you can even use the analyze command and it will suggest a module that you can run. Neat. Looks great. Am I right in saying you need a specific version of Nmap for that to work? I think only the most recent version, I think it's 7.18 or something like that works. Um, it's, it's the one that included the that script. Awesome, looks good. And finally, we have a team for your unquoted URI handler SMB redirect by our own uh, Christoph. All right, so um, TeamViewer uh, is a software for a remote control, uh, desktop sharing, online meetings, web conferencing, and file transfer between computers. And this model exploits an encoded parameter call within the TeamViewer URI handler to create an SMB connection to an attacker controlled IP. So the, uh, all the major versions from 8 to uh, 15 were vulnerable and uh, the issue has been fixed in the latest uh, release for each major version. So the exploits simply set up an HTTP server and wait for the victim to connect. Um, then it will deliver a specially crafted uh, HTML page with the custom TeamViewer URI handler uh, so note that this requires some kind of social engineering to force the user to click on the link. And uh, um, this only works with uh, Firefox. Uh, the reason is because all their browsers encode the space between the SMB locations, so in the payload, uh, and this prevent the exploitation. All right, so let's... Uh, start this. So we're going to select the module. The, uh, this is an auxiliary server module. 
and uh, set up the options. So the first option is the file name. This is the um, file that would be accessed on the SMB server. The SMB server itself, right? And then the um, HTTP server that will deliver the payload. So it happens that it is the same IP here because for this demo, I'm running both on the same server, but you can run them separately. Then uh, other options are default, including the URI handler, uh, which is TeamViewer 10. Uh, it works on most of the versions. Um, you, have, you can try other handler if it doesn't work, especially with older versions. Right, so we have our uh, target, uh, actually our Windows machine. And uh, we're going to set up our SMB server. So for this, we're going to use a responder. Um, it will uh, launch an SMB server and try to uh, uh, gather the hashes from incoming SMB uh, requests. So we're going to go ahead and stop the uh, uh, HTTP server, grab the link and passed it uh, in Firefox. Right. So what's going to happen is Firefox will open a TeamViewer and TeamViewer desktop will uh, try to access this SMB server. So the result is uh, Windows will try to authenticate, so try to do an NTLM authentication with our uh, uh, SMB server. Um, this uh, responder will uh, uh, um, stop the handshakes and uh, will force Windows to uh, uh, give some uh, hashes, including the NTL, uh, NTLM v2 SSP hash, which can be uh, cracked using tools like uh, uh, John the Reaper or Hashcat. So we're going to go ahead and, and uh, uh, run it with uh, John the Reaper. So Responder actually saves everything on, uh, into a log, log file, which is pretty handy. So we just need to run John on the, on the file. And here we go. We have the password. So it is, a, it is an easy to understand bug. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, try to go into details here. Um, so I'm going to go uh, start again, uh, responder, and uh, look at the payload. So I'm going to close this and look at the source. So this is what our HTM, uh, HTTP server is actually sending. So as you can see, um, the handler is followed by uh, uh, two parameters. And the issue is that uh, when Firefox asks Windows to launch TeamViewer, um, the parameters are not coded. So this uh, makes the uh, TeamViewer desktop uh, uh, software to query the remote host uh, is it's trying to access the remote share this way, right? So to demonstrate this, I, I will start uh, Wireshark. Um, so let's clean this. All right. So to capture the SMB traffic, right? And uh, we've got to go ahead and start over. Right. There we go. So here we have the SMB request, uh, which includes the NTL, uh, NTLM authentication and uh, Responder is capturing the, the hashes. But Responder is smart enough to detect that the hash had been captured already. So uh, uh, it's, it's not gonna show them uh, twice. Right, so now let's have a look to the actual issue. So when you open registry editor, the classes root key, you're going to find your handler. So the TeamViewer 10 uh, handler here. 
So let's have a look to the command. So this will be executed when uh, uh, Firefox, uh, 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 it, this will be executed by Firefox. Um, and as you can see, the actual argument is not coded. So to fix this, just add some codes here. There we go. And this should mitigate uh, the issue. So let's start over and confirm that no SMB request um, has been sent this time. And uh, we'll round out our meeting as we, we always do with an update on Attacker KB, the Attacker Knowledge Base, where you can learn about and discuss which phones matter and why. Just visit attackerkb.com. Uh, today we've got an update uh, demo from James on the topic header updates. Okay, so uh, this is a real quick update. This is some work that uh, um, Louis did uh, recently. It's, in, it's not deployed yet, but uh, it should be soon. Um, basically, it's uh, updates to this top section of a topic right here. Um, this is prod. This is what things currently look like. You can see we've got like the attacker value over here. And then there's like this like column with like, where exploitability and then you'd like some um, you know, key features like uh, this comes from the CVSS score. Uh, so the attack vector privileges required user interaction. Uh, we we our, some of our newer features that we're working on behind the scenes still uh, require, or we wanted to put up here and we were kind of out of space. So um, we uh, worked with uh, the UX team and um, got some updates here that would uh, kind of clean up this data a little bit and then also uh, give us more room to put more information in. So here's what it looks like in the dev branch. Um, you can see that uh, the exploitability and uh, all of the features have been moved up here. Um, so this now stretches all the way across. Uh, this is actually a pop-up that um, uh, was added by uh, Jorge, who also recently joined the team. He um, added this to make it so we can inform users about the watch topic feature. Um, so new users will see this and, uh, you know, it's kind of an incentive to get them to watch the topic and um, continue to get notifications on it. Um, otherwise, it was just kind of hidden and you had to know to look for it. So you can just dismiss this with the X, but um, yeah, it's kind of a simple change, but uh, basically all of this um, data that was over here in this column has been moved up to the top. So now the title can really stretch and this one's still kind of wrapped. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much the gist of it. Um, some of the newer items we're gonna be adding are gonna appear down here uh, and you'll see those when we get them done. But um, yeah, curious what people think about the changes and if they like them. These are yeah, a lot more readable. Yeah, it's great. Also, um, did you guys check on the mobile experience? How, how did that change the mobile experience as well? Uh, we're still working through the mobile experience. There's uh, a couple of stacking issues and stuff that we're, we're trying to figure out. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to demo it here. <laughs> it is, this is the reason it's not deployed yet. <laughs> okay, awesome. You're thinking about it. That's, that's awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I got a question on it. Um, yeah. So above, I know I noticed that there's like the attack value, exploitability, all those things. And above the actual value, there's like a gray text. Uh, do you guys mm -hmm. have plans to add like uh, a gray text label above the watch value? Um, that way it's, you know, like it, uh, mm -hmm. an infographic icon is useful, but text is also good to help the user understand the layout. Yeah, it's not something that we'd actually discuss, but that's a good point. I see what you're saying. Um, I'm not sure. I can bring that up with the UX team and see what they think. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And this is Thank this you. is coming soon. Yeah. Yeah, this is coming soon. Like we we <laughs> Leo found our our uh, stuff that we were trying to slide under the rug. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> the mobile view still needs a little bit of work. <laughs> right on. Iterate. It's okay. Yeah. Cool. Excellent.